My name is Barbara Kolm. I'm the director of the Austrian Economic Center in Vienna and the founder of the Free Market Roadshow. And we've been cooperating uh, with Svensk Disk Disk script, sorry, <laughs> and all Swedish and many of the Swedish think tanks for many, many, many years. Anders has been a speaker internationally for us at the Free Market Roadshow when touring Europe, you know, 40 countries within eight weeks. So it was always at least one of our Swedish friends whom we could count on. Of course, um, Johan Norbeck has been a speaker with us and Amanda Wolstead as well. And I'm looking forward to, to hearing from Jonas Frickland today for the first time, um, who has not been part of the live tour. But as you know, we do the, the free market roadshow this time in a, in a digital way, which is uh, challenging and interesting for everybody of us. And um, uh, we learn a lot, uh, as, as you can imagine. And behind me, you can see uh, the, the, the so-called uh, main topic, disruptive innovation. And when we decided to have this uh, topic last year uh, in the meeting with all our uh, um, we did not know what, what, is ha what was happening. So I think more than timely that we discuss um, this topic. And as the first speaker, I would like to invite um, Anders Eidstedt, who is a well-known entrepreneur and business person from, uh, from Sweden. Anders um, has a, was, a, was an advisor to major business and business organizations. He has studied engineering physics at Lund University and, um, of, and founded his first company when he was a student. And by now, he, he and his, his wife run many companies, more than 15, and they're they are focusing on, on the corporations that are range from robotized web hosting to operations of, of public laboratories. Very interesting. So you really have everything in your portfolio. And um, I would, and, and of course you are very much involved in, 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 in Swedish entrepreneurial politics. And this is uh, why I would like to give you the, the floor first. Anders, please. Thank you, Barbara. Thank, thank you for hosting this uh, free market roadshow from Sweden and uh, I, I have a long, as, as Barbara said, I have a long background in both entrepreneurship but I've also been an advisor to business organizations in Sweden and uh, during this crisis of course a lot of people look at Sweden for several reasons and, and probably touch that also but I think one area that's interesting in Sweden is that the business community has been uh, much more pro-market than pro-business compared to a lot of other European countries. And, uh, and uh, that has to do, of course, with the, the crisis. Uh, we had uh, the Social Democrats wanted to introduce uh, special funds uh, controlled by, by the unions to take control over, over business, businesses. And uh, the business community saw the threat from, from this socialist policy. And, and, and they joined forces to fight yeah, socialism in, and, and, and that way we also got the business community. I think that's much more pro-market than pro-business compared to other countries. So looking at the crisis now when, when all businesses, the market is mostly closed down, e even if it's not regulated, closed down, it's also social distancing is closing a lot of businesses for us. And we can see that the, the businesses are very much turning their, yeah, they, they look at government for subsidies during the crisis. And I, I think that's necessary, of course, but, but it's also a threat when people and business people look at, at money from, from government. We have to, to change that when the crisis, when markets opens up again, that, 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 that business people look for money from the market instead of from the politicians. And uh, I'm very much afraid of, of uh, we can see a lot of uh, organizations and companies and so on looking for their pet projects, building bridges to nowhere and so on, things like that. And, and how to get back to a market economy after this crisis for, for this, uh, after this crisis, that I think is an important uh, issue that we should talk about. And that's why we have invited this 
panel for today to 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 talk about how how can we do that. So and yeah, that's my actually my short introduction to this. And if, if I may interrupt right away, um, Anders, thank you very much for setting the ground or for laying the ground. First of all, all our speakers, please feel free. You find the chat version or the chat uh, symbol at the bottom of, of the screen. Uh, feel free to send questions and to, and to, to ask or to ask questions um, for our debate then that we can direct, direct uh, immediately to our speakers. But what Anders has said and is so so important that all of a sudden all the uh, all the enterprises uh, who have who are not uh, who were not the ones who started this crisis or who who have um, who are now in the position of begging uh, and have to ask for support and help and this is something that actually entrepreneurs and and uh, uh, people who are self responsible do not like at all but now they were pushed into a certain direction and I think it is important to discuss that how we can get how we can kickstart the economy again without making um uh, making entrepreneurs recipients of subsidies and of government um, support and i think this is something you know as as reagan once said let the markets work and let uh, let enterprises alone don't regulate them or not over regulate them provide the right framework and that's basically it so i think this is what we also need to discuss and as as you mentioned um the Swedish model was completely different when you how you dealt with the crisis. So, Anders, would you like to to add a little bit more on that uh, before I uh, before I introduce Jonas Fricklund as the second speaker? I think I think uh, Johan Norberg is better to address that area. But at, as it looks, we have uh, at, until today we have uh, we have the markets is much more open than in other countries regulated. But of course, people are also self responsible for for being careful and that makes also a bit complicated for a lot of businesses like for instance we are part owner of laboratories and i think i always thought that could be the most secure businesses business that we were owner of but it's totally a lot closed down now so so it's 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 also complicated but yeah i think the other speakers are better on that subject Okay, then, uh, then I have the, the privilege as, as uh, you sent me the, the program and we have um, Johan Norberg on the program, a writer and senior fellow at Cato Institute and he has just published another book uh, that he probably will also uh, tell us a little bit about. Um, but Johan is a really classical liberal and, and, and lecturer and documentary filmmaker. Um, he's born in Sweden and he, and, um, he is, uh, I think, moving between the worlds. He, he received uh, his MA in, this, in History of Ideas from the University of Stockholm. And his most recent book is Progress, 10 Reasons to Look Forward to the Future. And it was uh, Book of the Year in The Guardian. Uh, the Economist and The Observer published it in, in 20 countries. In September, his next book is published and it's called Open uh, the Story of Human Progress. Um, I will simply open the floor to um, Johan. Johan and, and, and I have known each other for many, many, many years uh, because we were sharing the same uh, networks in the European free market movement and also in the Uni United States. Um, and having mentioned that, of course, uh, Johan is frequently in DC when he's with, uh, with Cato and other institutions. Johan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Barbara, and thank you for hosting this seminar on an incredibly important and timely topic, I think. I've been asked to reflect on pro-business and pro-market, what they mean and what they entail and why this is important. And let me begin to do that by telling you a story. For a recent film project, I visited a 99-acre farm in Wabash County in Indiana in the United States, run by Jeff Hawkins and his son, Zach, 
a family farm. I think Zach is the sixth generation farmer. It's been owned by the Hawkins family, this farm since uh, the 1950s. They raise hogs, cattle and poultry, and they sell primarily to families and to restaurants in their area. It's very small scale, about 200 birds a week, and they uh, do this uh, based on an exception, an exemption that allows small farmers to process their own chickens on the farm, rather than sending them off to a large poultry processor, which is the normal way of doing business. In 2015, they told me, they were asked by the Indiana State Legislature to make a presentation on farmers markets and local restaurants. So they went there happily bragging about their fabulous product and their great relationship with the area and with the local restaurants. And when they finished their presentation, they expected the chair of the committee to say something like, wow, that's fantastic, marvelous. I wish more businesses like this existed in our area. Uh, but she didn't. She after their presentation, she just said, well, that's illegal. You shouldn't be able to do this on your own farm. That's dangerous. And she went straight to the Indiana State Department of Health and requested that they issue a cease and desist letter. So they immediately had to stop selling and serving and restaurants had to stop serving chickens from their farm. After a couple of weeks of confusion, uh, the state attorney declared that it was in fact legal for the Hawkins farm to do it like this, based on this 50 year old exemption to the general rule. But that wasn't welcomed by certain senators. They instead drafted a new law in order to make it illegal for them to process their own chickens on their farm. They claimed this was dangerous even though there has not been one recorded case of foodborne illness from birds that have been butchered under this exemption for now some 50 years. Uh, but the senators had strong supporters, uh, the senators who wanted to ban this. The opposing side was not only represented by state regulators, but also by large agricultural lobbying interests, including the Indiana State Poultry Association, representing the businesses who uh, control the market. They were up against a very small competitor, just 200 birds a week, but it was so threatening because they represented a different business model and they wanted to use the whole machinery of the state and the police to stop them from doing this. And they were also joined by the, the Indiana Pork Producers Association and the Indiana Beef and Cattle Association, even though they don't have much to do with poultry and chicken. Why am I telling you this? I do this to warn you all that businesses do not always like markets and they certainly do not always like competitors. It's like the old saying goes, monopolies are a bit like babies. Nobody likes them until they get their own and then they really love them. And th I do it to remind you that many subsidies, standards and regulations that seem to be well intended and serve a good purpose also serve to destroy alternatives and competitors and everything that do not fit this particular way of doing business that we're all used to. And we should worry about all of these things, especially now during this pandemic and afterwards. Uh, I am, um, Anders talked about this, um, everybody wants some help from the government right now. And uh, personally, you know, I'm the fiercest opponent of state help to, to businesses and to bailouts, but this time is a little bit different. Traditionally, I oppose them because they often go to the least competitive businesses to protect business models that are outdated and are not financially sound. Um, or often they go to businesses as a reward for having made stupid mistake as the subsidies to the bailouts to the financial industry after the, the financial crisis in 2008. But this time is a bit different. This is not a support to uh, uncompetitive, the least competitive businesses or as a reward to anyone for having done stupid things. This is an external shock that destroys healthy businesses 
as well. And sometimes because they are banned by governments from doing business. And in that case, I think they deserve some compensation. And I think that there is some role to be had for uh, state support, even though I would rather see something like a general tax holiday rather than specific support for specific businesses, uh, because a general tax holiday wouldn't promote one business ahead of another. There wouldn't be a role for governments to choose the most worthy uh, recipient of, of the support, but something uh, can certainly be done. But there are two other very important risks right now, I think, relating to pro the risk of politics being pro-business rather than pro-market. The first thing is that we now have a general trend towards some element of self-sufficiency in our economies. As we face dramatic risks, we fear uh, of being too much dependent on other uh, economies, on, on um, on other countries and there is a risk that governments will begin to pick not just winners but picking important businesses that are too important for us to be uh, dependent on others for and there's a risk that they will begin to subsidize them and protect them from competition and therefore also to control them because when the government provides you with a helping hand they also tend to tie you up hand and feet with all manners of restrictions and demands and you can certainly not be free to make business decisions and decisions on uh, uh, what to do with the profits that you generate. So I see a risk for a rebirth of industrial policy through the back door in the, this time of, of crisis. The second risk that we are facing now I think is that everybody wants a big project to restart the economy. Uh, they want some big public project or particular companies that can really give a kick, uh, kick start and, and start to hire again if they only get particular exemptions or support or subsidies and they'll create lots of jobs and they'll help, help politicians with, with everything they want. And then we should always remember what um, the 19th century French economist Frédéric Bastiat told us. There are things that are seen and there are things that are not being uh, not seen and we have to focus on both of those things. When you support particular projects, particular businesses, we will certainly see them producing new jobs and expanding but what we don't see is what would happen with those resources, those investments if we didn't take them and politicians didn't guide resources into certain business models rather than others. Every dollar, every euro is taken out of the pockets of consumers and businesses who would have used them in some other way. And we won't see all those companies and those jobs that would have been created. So the only thing that happens is that we remove decisions on which businesses to support from millions of consumers and put them in the hands of a handful of politicians and bureaucrats. And that's incredibly dangerous, especially when we are trying to get out of a very deep slump, a global depression. Then more than ever, we need open markets and fierce competition because not every business model will be viable after this crisis. We need to make sure that those that aren't are put out of their misery and that capital and labor are transferred to more viable business models that can expand and hire on a sustainable basis and not just based on the whims and the preferences of particular politicians. I don't know which business models uh, will be successful in the future, and neither do you and Merkel and Macron and Trump and Johnson and Stefan Levin certainly don't. If they think they do, they should feel free to invest all their savings, all their own private savings in those business models instead of demanding that the rest of us do. So that's my message. But you might wonder what happened to the Hawkins family farm? Well, they started a social media campaign. They told everybody who 
bought their chickens and uh, every restaurant told their consumers that if you enjoy this chicken, you might be interested in the fact that certain senators want to stop you from eating this in the future. So why don't you tell them that you don't like this? It created a public uproar and outcry and it actually forced the politicians to back down. Uh, so they, the family farm could keep racing and processing their 200 chickens a week to the delight of households and restaurants in the area and uh, they could continue to scare the bigger companies with uh, potential competition if they strayed too far away from producing a good product and a good chickens. So the happy end to this story is that David in fact defeated Goliath and it seems like these public campaigns the social media campaigns really worked. Transparency is the best disinfectant. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Johan. I mean, uh, talking about a farm that is close to Warburg College, uh, where Austrian economics is definitely taught all the time, uh, is, is, is great. And thank you for bringing this story and for combining uh, the reality with our theory and also bringing in Bastia, who is uh, also important to us. Uh, but I won't take Amanda's job, who will do the, the summary of, uh, of our conversation here. Uh, but I would like to... Uh, uh, just remind you that competition is something that without without competition we would not be anywhere and we just have to keep it up and this is what what uh, Johan's message is, is is very important or why it is important so without further ado let me introduce you to Jonas Fricklund uh, who is the deputy chief economist at the Confederation of Swedish Enterprise and in an earlier role he was senior economist at the Federation of Swedish Industries Jonas has been political advisor to on social affairs to the Prime Minister Karl Bildt. And of course, he holds an MSc in industrial economics from Linköping uh, Institute of Technology. Uh, without further ado, Jonas, the floor is yours. I would look forward to hearing you. Oh, thank you, Barbara. Um, and thank you, Johan, for uh, the very interesting uh, topics that you brought up. Uh, always a great reminder for uh, people in business uh, to see the, the bigger picture. Uh, when we are talking about this um, distinction between pro-business and pro-market, that is something that we are very much aware of. And in fact, we, we are trying to institutionalize uh, this in our business organization. So uh, if I may just first tell you something about the, the Confederation of Swedish Enterprise. Uh, we cover 60,000 member companies uh, that has about 1.7 million uh, employees. Uh, we cover most of the branches and industries. But the interesting thing in this perspective is that we are organized uh, uh, as a confederation and we have 49 member organizations. So these specific uh, industry organizations uh, are closer to business and somewhat more closer to the pro-business agenda. Uh, but they are in their turn members in our association. And what we are doing is that we are trying to connect what is the common interest of all businesses. And in, in that respect, we are pushing a pro-market agenda. Uh, and that is explicitly stated in our strategy uh, of course, the reality is always a bit cheeky. How will you uh, put, the, put the border between the, those two things? But it is explicit in our, in our discussions. And uh, when two different uh, industry branches put something uh, forward, and uh, it is so obvious that they are competing exactly for some kind of specific business interest, then that is not a topic for us. Then they will have to take it themselves. But if there are some common interests, uh, then we will uh, take this up and uh, do lobbying and so on. So we are trying in our organizations to get a sort of balance between the pro-business and the pro-market agenda. Um, so, so that is one thing. Uh, uh, now we have the corona. Um, and um, yeah. Of course, everything is uh, mixed up. Uh, uh, I think I have struggled my whole uh, <laughs> uh, life as an economist to get rid of 
business subsidies uh, and so on. And uh, now since a couple of months, I find myself being kind of a designer of uh, business subsidies. Um, but um, um, the philosophy of, behind it is that we see this as an uh, uh, insurance uh, where we have put in a lot of money into the state uh, and building up a really big coffer, state coffers. And now with this um, uh, accident, uh, we are getting out some of that money to survive. When we are constructing this kind of um, um, schemes uh, in connection with politicians and so on, uh, we still try to get them as general as possible uh, so that we are not trying to pick winners uh, because uh, we want as many companies in, uh, to survive uh, 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 over the board. But um, uh, um, still, of course, this will, uh, there will be some kind of legacy uh, afterwards. And of course, we, we foresee that. So I think it was very fast in this uh, crisis, uh, the scheme of things. Uh, and there will be some businesses getting too much money, others getting too little, and so on. Uh, so it, it, it is not uh, as clean as you would like it to have. And of course, it kind of changes the psychology. Uh, so in the Swedish business community, we have been so much afraid of the state um, because they always want to raise the taxes uh, and we will say don't raise taxes and don't give us subsidies so that is kind of in the DNA of many business people and that is uh, has been a very uh, good thing for us um, but now uh, when people see it well actually you could get subsidies from the state maybe I should push my specific subsidy agenda just uh, use this opportunity. Uh, so a lot of people are getting a lot of ideas. And it's, of course, not only in the business community. It is, it's all, all over the world. All interest organizations see this kind of window of opportunity. Uh, so, uh, um, of course, this will lead to some sort of impossible equation because even though we have a lot of money <laughs> that we are using right now, we have uh, spent uh, in Sweden 3.8% of GDP on uh, uh, subsidies to business, although half of that is going to a wage compensation scheme, so actually turning up in the, in the, uh, in the pockets of empl employees who don't lose their job. So, uh, but, but still, there are lot, there's a lot of money uh, going in, but it can't go on forever. Um, and with all those wishing lists that are uh, for the for the present moment, constructed everywhere, uh, it would be an impossible equation. So we will need to get to a halt. Uh, I don't know exactly when, but it will be a halt. Uh, and then we will try. We will need to get back to uh, a more normal, um, uh, market-friendly environment, uh, and also, of course, fill up the public sector uh, coffers for the next crisis. Uh, what? Um, also, I think um, uh, Johan stressed uh, are the sort of uh, risk that we see in, in the mindset of people getting more and more afraid, more afraid of globalization um, uh, and uh, uh, trying to enhance under the umbrella of security uh, reasons, a lot of uh, uh, restrictions. And, and, uh, if we will go that road uh, to, to back down on globalization, we will get tremendous costs. And uh, people, I don't think people realize uh, how big wins we have gotten the, the, the last decades and how, how big costs could be if, we, if we're trying to roll, roll that back. Of course, we will need strategies to, uh, to meet the new environment uh, to, to see how can we be more prepared for new crises, for new pandemics and so on. But uh, it is important that those strategies mainly uh, are 
dealt with within the business strategy community. So instead of uh, building up politics for supply chains, we need to have strategies for sourcing within companies. Uh, like for example, Ericsson, uh, uh, they had a problem uh, uh, several years ago when they uh, got problems with, with, with a supply in China. Uh, there, they took a decision to have uh, alternative sourcing uh, so that they will not be depend on, on only that supplier. So they will have their own supplier in China still, uh, but another supplier somewhere else in the world. Uh, and it would be impossible to, to know where will a pandemic crisis hit next. I mean, you would need to have a sourcing strategy for, for Northern Italy, for example, after this crisis. So if you have a supply in Northern Italy, maybe you should have someone in China also. Uh, and these kinds of sourcing strategies are best dealt with within companies uh, and, uh, and they will have new calculations and be better prepared next time. Uh, that is the way to go uh, instead of uh, uh, thinking that politics should, should deal with things that they are, are not suited to do. Uh, that is, of course, I think an important strategy uh, uh, moving ahead. So, yeah. Well, th thank you very much, Jonas. I think you raised a couple of very important questions and our audience is already getting nervous. But uh, <laughs> since you mentioned globalization and the, 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 the danger that we, that we probably of losing it, maybe, maybe Johan will write uh, in defense of global capitalism 2.0 uh, and then restart again and then tell people why we need globalization and uh, why we should not um, uh, get back uh, back down. But I have a couple of, of questions and the first one actually comes from Owen and Owen says, uh, um, what is the most imp uh, important measure that should be carried out by government uh, that close down their economies to allow individuals the freedom to recover once they start to reopen the economy. He didn't, uh, Owen didn't mention to whom this was addressed. So whoever wants to pick this up and really briefly answers this question before I send you the next ones. Johan maybe, or uh, Anders or Jonas. Yeah, I can contribute my own thoughts on this. And it's interesting that mm. this is a Swedish seminar because Sweden did things differently. We did not shut down businesses and schools and uh, public transportation, no, lockdown stay in place orders or anything like that so um that might put us in a position to um guide others out, out of this eventually i would say based on uh, my own personal experiences and some of the evaluations that are being done in sweden and in other places is that one of the first things to do is to start schools again starting schools because it seems like according to the Norwegian Public Health Authority it didn't help in any way to reduce the um, spread of the disease uh, but it hurt the economy dramatically because especially with younger kids parents then have to leave their work and their businesses and not everybody can do their work on a distance uh, uh, like that so starting schools again seems to be a, a good first um, way of doing it and it also seems like children are not uh, do not uh, get it in a disastrous way themselves and it seems like they're not the super spreaders that we thought initially well thank you and uh, my next question uh, comes actually how to finance the government cost of the crisis and if we look at the tremendous amount of money that is being put now on the table, it's 3.4 trillion or 25% of the EU's GDP that is being provided by the EU member states to solve the so-called uh, uh, COVID pandemia. I mean, this is a lot of money and uh, which, where, where does this go? Where do we, and how do we finance that? So who would jump on that question? Anders here. I think I cannot try to answer that and also the, my answer to the first question. I think we, we shouldn't do the crisis worse by doing all these big pet projects from building the highest building in, the, in Scandinavia or something like that or the biggest bridge to nowhere or something like that. The, the cost of all those projects could make the crisis even worse. So I think that's the first, that's 
that's the I think Johan has a good answer what to do and I have a my, my answer on what not to do after a crisis that's so uh, and and talking about financing I think there is a lot of discussion about raising taxes but I think this is a good time perhaps for governments to to find out what assets to sell actually to to finance the crisis and make the our yeah society more uh, create more freedom for people in many countries oh and thank the you Jonas would you like to add something on that uh, or move to yeah, the on, on, on the financing question I, I, I would like to say that uh, well I, I think it's important not to think or have the illusion that you can finance it quickly um, if you would quickly raise taxes or whatever do something to to regain all the money uh, then that will hurt the economy so you will have a sort of long-term plan for for get, getting uh, getting back uh, in Sweden we have the experience from the 90s crisis and it took at least 10 years to get back from that uh, so you have a long, long term perspective and otherwise, of course, effectiveness in, in government, that's the, the solution. Okay, since you're now, uh, uh, you're on the, on the mic, there is a question directly to you. Uh, why, does you why do you think that Swedish enterprise has opted for a pro-market approach while many uh, other organizations in mm -hmm. other countries regarding enterprise has been more pro-business? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I would say that uh, we uh, saw a big threat uh, 40 years ago uh, when we had a, a social democratic government who was more left-wing than it is nowadays, um, where the trade unions had a plan to kind of take over uh, socialism through, through, through uh, owning shares in the companies. Uh, and that created a sort of uh, a movement uh, in, in history where uh, businesses came together and fought that. Uh, and that is kind of uh, still around. Uh, and uh, then, of course, we have proven to be successful with this um, uh, agenda in, in getting through structural reforms and so on that are beneficial for all. So, so that's kind of the historical explanation. Uh, thank you very much, Jonas. And I have a last question here before I hand over to Amanda. Um, is it possible to distinguish between the costs of the virus and the costs of government measures? Should businesses get compensation for the costs of the virus or is this, is this a business risk that business ought to take into consideration when they make decisions? It's a very tricky one, so who wants to start? <laughs> it is uh, tricky. Yeah. Go ahead, Jonas. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, it is tricky. Uh, of course, uh, it is better to be prepared and, uh, uh, and companies try to, to have a strategy for whatever may happen. Uh, but uh, still, many companies are rather small. And if the government were not able to foresee this crisis, uh, how could a small company do it? So uh, it, th that would be the ideal, but uh, I, I don't think so. We, we need as a society to, to uh, to have a crisis management in, in this situation. Would you like to add? I, I could just add that uh, I think, no, it's impossible to distinguish between these two in a perfect way because they're intimately related. Obviously, if uh, governments uh, ban people from traveling to other countries, that's a disaster for the airline industry. On the other hand, how many, many would have flown anyway uh, in, in this day and age with this pandemic going on? So perhaps it's not entirely the, the government shutdown that uh, creates this uh, this problem. So I guess in a way when we talk about compensation we would have to look at the specific industry and perhaps compare many countries I think to what happened in Sweden where we almost in every instance it has just been voluntary social distancing and that has been enough to hurt lots of businesses and industries as well and that's why i would like to see another way of, of a general support for businesses which is not really related to the particular industry you're in rather than rather uh, removing taxes generally having a tax holiday for lots of, for for every business no matter where they are because then things like for example some companies were already over 
leveraged and had too much debt and they shouldn't be sort of bailed out and helped because of that more than any other business that made more sound decisions before the pandemic. Okay, um, wonderful. Um, so is there anything, Anders, that you would like to add on that topic? I, I agree with both Jonas and Johan, and I think uh, also the, in some way you can say that the state compensates for regulations, like on the labor market, if, of course, if, if companies had more freedom to, to yeah, control their labor, how many employees they had, of course, that then they could perhaps also lower the cost. And if we have a regulated labor market, then it's, I think it's, I think it's necessary for, for the government to, to, to stay to take that cost in that, this kind of crisis that no one could foresee. That's my yeah, short Thank answer. Thank you, Anders. I, I think we, we, we touched upon so many topics that we, we need an, an extra or another <laughs> seminar in, in Stockholm again. Please, can you, we, we need to organize that, whether it's uh, governments owning shares of companies and, and uh, which is a, a huge debate right now, as also in continental Europe these days. And it's not only airlines, it's many, many, many other industries that will keep us busy. Uh, but uh, without further ado, I would like to hand over to Amanda Volstedt, who is the editor-in-chief of uh, the Swedish liberal conservative online magazine Svenska District, and she's a former editor and writer um, of Southern Sweden evening paper Kvalsposten. Apologies for my poor uh, Swedish. And Amanda, of course, has acted as a vice chair of the Confederation of Liberal and Conservative Students uh, from 2008 to 2009, and as an international secretary for the same organization uh, from 2010 until 2015. And she also served as the secretary general of the Nordic Conservative Student Union and as a national representative to European Democratic students. She studied security policy in the Swedish National Defense College. So a very interesting career. And uh, Amanda, feel free to sum up and um, provide us with your thoughts, additional thoughts. And I would simply say thank you for joining us and, or, and uh, also for co-host, uh, being able to co-host this event um, uh, with, uh, with Anders Eidstedt. And I would like to thank Johan Norberg and also Jonas Frickland for being with us and for your thoughts. And as I mentioned before, I think there is much more that needs to be discussed and also how disruptive we may be in the future to get back our individual and entrepreneurial freedoms. But Amanda, the floor is yours, please. Thank you. Uh, we usually do this uh, during the course of an afternoon and the subject certainly lend itself to a longer seminar. So yeah, we will definitely be getting back to the topic. Uh, I will take uh, my start, I think, in the last uh, question. Uh, because it is a very special situation. You can't, of course, uh, argue that that uh, crisis is a cost of doing business and, and you should have a certain preparation uh, in case uh, the restaurant chef uh, becomes suddenly ill or you have bad weather or whatever. But no one could plan for this, obviously. You can't plan for the market entirely grounding to a halt from one day to another. Uh, and this is an incredible special situation and, and uh, hopefully for most of us this will be the one uh, biggest disruption on markets during our li lifetimes. In Sweden in particular, businesses, the cost of doing business is high, the cost of taxes is very high, so high that it impairs uh, the, the possibility for most business owners to save up uh, to handle a crisis on their own. Uh, taxes becomes the insurance policy you sign on for whether you want to or not. And that also uh, gives the government a special responsibility. Uh, because if you have, want to save up money, then you have to either take them out of the company, uh, make them not working for you anymore, and also pay taxes for it. Uh, or you have to, it's a complicated situation, it's a very pricey one. Uh, and therefore, if you have the kind of tax levels that we have, I do think it's reasonable to expect that the government will also help you out in an extreme situation such as this. In the end, I think it's a question of 
whose money it is anyway. And it's not the state's money. It's the companies and the persons who work for the money and create the man money and create the value. Uh, and it's, it's honestly, uh, I'm a big of, a, of an opponent to business subsidies as any proper old fashioned liberal, uh, but you can't take other people's money and then leave them out to dry in such a situation as this. It's an absurd idea, which I think we've touched on both uh, Jonas and Yuan especially. Uh, then again, it is this situation which Yuan covered especially, what we see and what we don't see. Uh, we also see in Sweden especially a lot of businesses, a lot of uh, high street chains that has been going uh, quite badly for years, who hasn't adopted to the new economic market, who hasn't adopted to on online shopping, and who's going out to business and sort of blaming the corona situation, which pretty much only brought on a situation that was going to come anyway. And it is, of course, incredibly important that we don't uh, keep non-working businesses alive with, with uh, state money that, that uh, we need to be very careful with in this situation. Uh, so it's a hard, uh, hard question in many ways. Sweden is very lucky, as Jonas touched on, that we have a Svens uh, Nærhetsliv who is through market and, and who keeps being through market in a situation where many other organizations like them are uh, more pro-business and the way uh, sort of protectionism of, of outdated business models. Uh, we will see, I think, in the, the after Corona, sort of a creative destruction and we will need that creative destruction. So it's a very hard uh, sort of way off which, which need protection and which needn't. And, of course, as you both been talking about, tax cuts is probably the safest way to let the market sort itself out since, uh, well, let them keep their money and see what they can do with it. Uh, you also touched on, I think this is incredibly important, uh, as uh, Barbara said, my background is in uh, security politics uh, and when I don't uh, defend free markets, I sort of want to defend other things with big guns. Uh, and I think we also have a hard situation here where the Swedish, well, all health systems uh, haven't been able to access the protective gear they've been needing. And you have this sort of a discu discussion, how much should we have kept in storage for a situation like this? How much can we trust international trade in a crisis situation? How much can we trust uh, even within the EU, we had situations where uh, countries try to hoard material for themselves and break the pre market. That is a real danger uh, and it's a risk to be very, very costly and to bring free trade, free travel and, and not at least the European cooperation back decades if we're not careful. At the same time, we in, in security studies, you often talk about generals always planning for the last war. Uh, and that is a real risk here as well, because there will be other crises, but there probably won't be another corona crisis. Uh, and that is in that situation, uh, even if we make sure we have all the protective gear the hospitals need for another pandemic, which is probably a good idea we can be pretty sure that there will be other crises that we haven't thought about. And we need to keep the free trade and keep cooperation so that we will be prepared for whatever happens next. Another great danger that we haven't quite touched on, the news came today that China is now taking a stake in the airline company in Norwegian. And that is also, I think, a quite a challenge for free market friends because in a way they bought those shares fair and square. On the other hand, very little about China is fair and square. And it is uh, important infrastructure suddenly being partly controlled by a totalitarian state who has an interest in disrupting uh, Nordic markets. And that is something that we, we friends of free trade will need to handle and we need to discuss now, I think, when uh, important infrastructure and important businesses will have uh, little choice but to accept the money they're given unless they can find uh, fairer deals elsewhere. 
Um, and this too, I think it's important that democratic states are careful about going in as owners for companies and state companies and so on, because we need to lead by example. And it's very hard to tell uh, other states that they're not allowed to buy into infrastructure and start controlling businesses if, if we do the same thing. Uh, this crisis, if we learn anything today, and if it's something we should bring onwards, is that it shows the importance of a small, focused and cheap state that has the funds to help out when it's needed and who doesn't meddle in markets when it's not needed so that companies can go, grow strong and have their own uh, savings and preparations uh, for the next time something happens. And I would just like to thank all your participants very, very much. Uh, I wish usually we would uh, offer you all a glass of wine now and continue discussions together with all our readers. And uh, I think that's the part I miss the most, the free discussions, uh, not planned, not via screen. Uh, that's where all the best ideas uh, are uh, thought up. So I hope next year we'll get a chance to see each other in person again. You're of course invited back then, as well as all our readers and watchers. Um, this pandemic has been something of a shock doctrine for digitalization and that was perhaps needed, but something do get uh, lost in, in the translation. And of course, we would like to send you all our uh, lovely Svenskids gift uh, fabric bag that you can use so you don't have to pay the Swedish state tax on plastic bags next time you go shopping. We have three choices, so please get back to me with which one you prefer and we will send it uh, to you. And I think that was pretty much it. Thank you so much, Barbara, for helping arrange this. I hope we get the chance to see you soon again as well. And thank you so much, Johan and Jonas. And uh, unfortunately, Jörgen Warborn couldn't uh, join us because of family reasons suddenly come up, but uh, we'll invite him next time as well.